As uh, we've been doing these interviews uh, for a couple of years now, actually, you um, you see ASOT as the start of your year, and you put a lot of effort into ASOT. How would you? Um, why is it? Obviously, it goes out to a lot of people, but why is it so important to you? Um, th- this uh, this weekend, almost well, apart from 2016, I lost my dad two years ago to cancer, and it's his birthday tomorrow. So when I go on the stage tonight. It's actually his birthday, and it was the same last year. The event was actually on his birthday, so I really, really wanted to, to do my best and to be my best. Just to, if he is looking down, I'm sure he is, that he can look down and he's proud of what I'm doing and that in the way that I'm doing it as well, I think. My name is Victor Kitson and I'm here in Amsterdam for a State of Trance 850 and I'm with Brian Carney. How are you doing today? Good man, very excited for later on and it's good to be back to do possibly my only interview this year so it's good to be back to speak to you again. Yeah, your only interview for this year? Yeah, well to, to be honest I'm not really into doing interviews, it's always sort of the same sort of answers and the same sort of so how did you get into it, what are you into, when did you start DJing, it's the same answers regurgitated the whole time I think when I speak to you we can go a little bit deeper and rather than it being an interview it's more of a conversation between the two of us so I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out today so am I uh, so am I we met a year ago actually at a state of trans 800 yeah how you been I've been good man uh, working hard uh, I think I had a solid year last year I was happy with how everything went um, I'm really happy with how this year has started already uh, my, my studio my first proper studio was finally finished its construction in January, so uh, I've already made about four tracks out of that studio in the space of, well, I started them but then took them in, and so over the past maybe two months I've finished four or five tracks, so I'm, I'm happy with my productivity, I'm happy with what I'm doing on a daily basis, so I'm, I'm in a good place at the moment, yeah. Last year you uh, just finished all over again, mm. uh, right before I set of trance. How, um, how do you look at the track right now, a year later? Um, I'm I'm very proud of what it achieved. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. I was a little bit down and a little bit disappointed that it didn't get shown of the year. But to to be honest, I was expecting uh, Gareth's track to get number one because I had such a it, it was released before my track and people knew what it sort of was and it was released on a ma- massive label like Monster Cat and it was obviously. Um, it was used as a frontage for a, a bullying campaign, and, and it's, it's a great track as well. So I always knew it was going to be difficult to get it, but at the same time, I was really appreciative of it getting voted into second place out of every single other track that was voted in last year. So, but it's it's not something I'm dwelling on. I'm not going to live off how well it did. I have another tr- vocal track ready for it tonight. So all over again is last year. The new track is this year. So. I'm excited to play all my new music tonight alongside the new vocal track. Tell us a little bit more about the the new vocal track for tonight. Yeah, so I was working on a trans track. Ideally, I was looking to get it done for John O'Callaghan's uh, Subculture CD, which he's uh, he's just finished and he's announced a track list for. And I sent it over to him maybe three or four weeks ago and he said, this is really good. I think it would be a shame not to put a vocal to it. So um, I'm, I'm really, really particular with the vocalists that I like and the sort of the ones that I want to work with and the ones that I've, the tracks I've played in the past. And one that sprang to mind, which is the track I've done for tonight, was with Deirdre McLaughlin. So she's she's Irish like myself, and um, she records out of a studio with Tommy. For, he used to be in Full Tilt, so he has the studio up there, and I get on really well with Tommy. So it was 
in terms of having to record it and all that stuff, it was really, really easy. So I approached her and she was up for it and she sent me back a, an idea and it worked really well. So I drove up to Letterkenny in Donegal and I spent a couple of hours working on it and getting it right and then Tommy tweaked it and sent me back the vocal and I've, it was actually pretty surprising how quickly the track actually come together. So um, I don't want anybody to see it as a follow-up to All Over Again. I think All Over Again in terms of the track, in terms of the reaction, and in terms of the vocal itself and the impact it have, it's 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 sort of a once in a lifetime track. That it's on its own. This track, it's by itself. Like say, you have kids, you have one kid, you're not going to compare it to the kid that was born before. You know, it's yeah. it's that sort of way. It's it's a, it's a different it's a different production from myself, but I'm really really happy with it. So if you're going to hear it later on in my set, alongside a, a lot of a lot of new tracks as well. I think maybe. 40 to 50 percent of the tracks I'm going to play are my own tracks, and I think I have roughly maybe 14 tracks on my playlist that I want to play, and 10 of them are tracks that people won't have heard before. So, as I've always said about ASOT, ASOT, this is my, this kickstarts the year for me every year. It gives me my focus in January, and when I come here, I want to really set the benchmark for the year in terms of the label myself. So I'm, I cannot wait to play later on. Now it's going to be good. As uh, we've been doing these interviews uh, for a couple of years now, actually, you um, you see ASOT as the start of your year, and you put a lot of effort mm. into ASOT. How would you? Um, why is it? Obviously, it goes out to a lot of people, but why is it so important to you? Um, th this uh, this weekend, almost well, apart from 2016, I lost my dad two years ago to cancer, and it's his birthday tomorrow. So when I go on the stage tonight. It's actually his birthday, and it was the same last year. The event was actually on his birthday, so in a way, I, I really want to put a lot of effort in, in terms of uh, just just the effort I put into my set and the, the tracks that I have, and it's just like I'm, I'm just sort of thinking about them, and I'm sort of uh, just sort of nearly want to make him proud, watching down that the effort that I'm putting into the event, um, because. I don't know, the last two years at times has been very hard, but I don't know, just maybe in January this month, I sort of, it was the two year anniversary in January, um, it sort of felt like the heaviness was lifting a little bit, and it's it's good because it's, for anyone who has lost someone, and uh, like he was diagnosed with um, cancer, and three weeks later he was dead, so it was some, that, that yeah, fast, two weeks, so, something that I've never sort of talked about, and it's sort of something that is difficult to speak about as well, but as I said, with the anniversary two, two weeks ago, I feel like that heaviness is lifting a little bit, and the grieving process is sort of moving on, because um, as he was sort of going through that sickness, like I, I was playing at um, Dream State San Francisco, and he was literally like in, in a bad way, but I was there like, what do I do, do I go and play, like, what do you want me to do? And he told me to go and play, and my mother told me to go and play. So I went and played, and then when I came back, I literally left. I got back to the to the um, airport, and I went straight to the hospital, and I was there for four days, non-stop, until he passed away on the Friday. And then that, that's the way it was. Yeah, that's sorry, the first time I've ever spoke about it properly, so it's, it's not an easy thing when, to speak about. When he was diagnosed, did you know that it was going to be that fast? No. or? But it's like pancreatic cancer, so it's it's vicious. Like once you're gone, you know. So um, it happened really fast. Um, it was hard to take. It's still hard to take now. But as I said, uh, as time goes on, time is a good healer. So I feel like it's getting better, bit by bit. Bit by bit, it's getting better. How do you um, how do you keep a career going after something like this? How do you keep on life going after this I sort of used that as an inspiration especially in 2016 I think I had one of my strongest years um, the carnage brand the events that we did everything well and that year everything just sort of just seemed to really kick on and I think that it was just sort of a, a personal drive within myself was sort of awakened where I, I really really wanted to, to do my best and to be my best just to, if he is looking down I'm sure he is that he can look down and he's proud of what I'm doing and that in the way that I'm doing it as well, I think. 
what did what did you and your dad talk about like the last couple of days when you knew that it was going to happen i guess well it it, it sort of happened so quickly but it's 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 sort of a thing between irish dads and irish sons that they don't say much to each other but they are they do get on well with each other you know they, they don't really have to say much to each other but i just uh i just remember he, he was always asking uh he was always asking uh, me and Adele when we were getting married. That was one of the things he was always asking. Always asking. Always asked that every single time he asked, when he's getting married. And another thing he was always asking was, uh, the, the, the place we used to rent, did, did, did you put your rent up? Have they increased your rent? I swear to God, every single time we walked into the house, he would ask the same two questions. When are you getting married and did you put the rent up? So, uh, so I just remember we were, we were talking to him and uh, he was sort of, he was he was in in between sort of wanting to fight on but wanting to give up because it, 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 the disease itself destroyed him. I don't know if you've ever seen anyone who goes through that pancreatic cancer like it, it ravages you from the inside out. Like he was just he was always being such a big strong man, and you could just see him wasting away, and it was horrible to see. And I just remember it was. It was the night before I had to actually go to San Francisco, and it just, he just got really emotional. And uh, we sort of just said goodbye, and that was sort of the last time we really spoke. But what can you do? How much did he, well, how much did he mean to you? A lot. A lot. How do you think that experience, um, now two years looking back at it, has affected you in your life? I think it just made me sort of more determined to be the, the very best at everything that I do. Um, life is precious and it can be gone like that. So just don't be a dickhead. Just be be a good person and, and work hard. I think if, if you live by that sort of motto, I think you'll be okay with everything you do. Yeah, definitely. That's the way to do it. What I like about you as a producer is that diversity. We talked about it a little bit before the yeah, interview yeah. as well. But how do you look at your own productions and the diversity in the music? Um, to, to be honest, at the moment, I do not really listen to much music other than when I'm working. Um, what does that mean? Your own music or other people's music? Other people's, or? Other people's music. It's just, in, the last, in the last while, I sort of, I'm sort of more focused on what I'm doing. Like I, I still like listening to music and that, but I'm when I'm making music now, I sort of just go into the studio and I'll have an idea and I'll work on it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be trance; it doesn't have to be anything else. But when I do listen to music, it doesn't tend to be trance. I know the music that I like, and when I'm making music and when it, when I'm making melodies, I tend to take my inspiration from non-trance music. So maybe I'll listen to like maybe pop music or whatever, songs that have really good melodies or stuff like that, and you can, you can take ideas from that, take that idea and transport it into your own track. And the sound that I'm, that I'm really liking and that I have liked over the last 12 months is sort of the Adam Bear, fellow Swede, like yourself, that sort of techno sound, so that, that sort of groove. So that, that's, that's, that's where I am musically right now in terms of the sort of music that I want to make. So if, if I go into the studio, I can literally just sit down and, and see what happens. I, <laughs> I don't really go in and say, right, I'm going to make trance today, I'm going to make that. But I am quite open-minded when it comes to making music, and I have, I have a quite a diverse range of how I can make it. I just don't want to make trance with an offbeat bass line and melodies and all the time. I, I like to mix it up. Because at the same time then, because I don't make many, say, like big room, uplifting anthems, it means the ones that I do make are going to have a lot of attention because they're going to be the only ones that I will make in that 12-month period. So I'll maybe only make another couple this year, but you have to think of it as well. I have the Key 4050 project with John, which is taking a lot of productions as well. And then I have my Carney Techno Alias, which is I have three new tracks to play tonight for the first time. So it's, it's, I've, I have a lot of stuff going on. And as I said, as I, when I go into the studio, it can change from day to day from whatever I want to work on. You kind of, you started out as a clubber, right? Yeah. And you kind of make music from a clubber's perspective. Yeah. I've seen in a previous interview yeah, as yeah. well. How would you evolve on that? Uh, well, I think it comes down to simplicity. If I know, I know from when I used to go out clubbing 
and I know now from DJing and the experience that I have gained from being a producer and from being a DJ over the past, say, 15 years, is that simplicity works best. A kick and a bass line gets the best reaction from a crowd. A good melody will get a good reaction from a crowd. So that is the most important thing to focus on. So I really do think that in this modern day, I think we need to keep things simple. We need to keep, uh, I think if things are a little bit too, has to make people think about it too much, I think people don't want it, don't want that. But at the same time, you need to have the little intricate parts of a song that maybe you might notice, or the little hidden melodies or other parts that are hidden in the background. But as I said, I'm repeating myself now, but simplicity is the key, I think, to modern day production skills, definitely. We're going to go deeper into uh, 40, 50 a little bit uh, yeah. as well. But, um, yeah, I guess you get to do a lot of more a lot more events now as a DJ yeah. compared to when you were a clubber, right? Yeah, definitely. Well, I haven't gone clubbing in a long time. I actually couldn't remember. I actually just prefer if I'm away and I, or when I'm not away, I prefer my weekends off now is just to chill out and just relax and <laughs> not drink and just take it easy. That's, that's, that's where I'm now. I'm keeping fit and training and sort of... I have my personal life here and then I have my business and my work life here. I have a happy medium between the two, so it's working really well at the moment. Is uh, DJing all over the world what you thought it would be? Uh, at the beginning, it has that novelty, but that novelty very quickly wears off. Don't get me wrong, I really still enjoy it. I appreciate what I have. I don't think I'm lucky because if I in, I'm insinuating that I'm lucky, it means that it's all falling onto my lap and I've just it's all magically happened for me. I've worked hard to get to where, I've, where I am. And I continue to work hard and I have a good attitude and I, I try to, to be a decent person and to have a good respect for the people who are, who are coming to see me. And that's how I have always been. So I've, I've worked hard to sort of get to where I get. But... I think people have this uh, sort of magical idea of how DJing is. It's you do this, you you fly here, and you're you're seeing all these places. But the the vast majority of the times you're flying in, you're tired, you're jet lagged. You get a couple of hours of sleep. You have to play. You play your set. You get a couple of hours of sleep, and you fly home. And uh, to be honest, sometimes uh, it hasn't really happened now for a while. But it's to to make that transition back into your normal life. It's, when, you, when you come back, you yeah, mean? When you come back, it can be quite difficult. I, the only really time it's happened for me uh, in the past, in a, in a long time, was after when we did the Key 4050 first performance at Dream State last year. It's because we had such a build-up and so much work building up to it over like eight to nine months in terms of studio work and in preparation and, and all the effort and all the stress we put ourselves through and the worry and all that. That when it was over, it was almost like, so what, what do we do next? Like we, had, we needed something else to focus on, but it only lasted for a couple of days. I was probably just tired and jet-lagged as well. But that, that was the only time that I sort of found that, that adjustment back into uh, normal life. But I'm, I'm quite lucky in that I'm quite grounded in terms of my normal life. I have a nice house, I have a Dell, I have my catch accent, so I can very quickly just fall back into my normal life. I'm not not coming home and dwelling on oh, what oh, I wish I was still away or oh, oh, this week, the weekend is over because I always have something else to look forward to and then I have something else to focus on that's not re revolving around music as well. What are the, um, as a DJ, like what are the best aspects of what you do? I think it's it, the, it, the experience of meeting people that you would never meet if you didn't do the music. I'm very, I appreciate the fact that I've traveled to so many different countries, I've met so many people, I've made friends in countries that I probably never would have even visited or even thought about visiting if I wasn't involved in this industry. So for me, it would be the, the overall experiences that you gain and the lessons that you learn. I think it, it has developed me as a person. I'm, I'm a lot more open-minded in terms of, because of the amount of people I've met and different cultures and different everything. I think it has developed my own sort of personality and my knowledge of the world in, in a way. And what's, um, <clears throat> what's the worst aspect of what you do? It's, pro it's probably being away and, and sort of missing the, the, the normality of life that other people sort of have, that they don't realize that they have. Like, I've missed so many weddings of my friends. I've missed birthday parties. I've missed a lot, you know. It's, it, 
you do have to make sacrifices. It's like if, if you want to be successful at anything in life, you have to make sacrifices. It's like if you want to be the best athlete in the world, you have to sacrifice everything in terms of your diet and your training and all that sort of stuff. So if, if you want to be a successful DJ producer, you're going to have to sacrifice the fact that you might not have a, an active social life at times. But at the same time, it has improved for me over the last couple of years because now... I'm luckily in a position where I can sort of pick and choose where I want to play. So if I don't want to go somewhere, I don't have to go. It's not, I'm not relying on constant gigs to support my income. I've, thankfully, I have a good income, and that means that I can take weekends off if I want, and I can do normal things. So I have a very nice, healthy balance between the two. Is it hard to do what you do? I think it is. I think... Um, If it was easy, everybody would do it. Like, I've started out DJing a long time ago, way below a lot of other people, and I don't know where they are now, so if it was easy, they'd still be here as well. So, um, but it's, it's not a magic fix, it's a culmination of hard work from throughout the years, and it's a momentum built up throughout the years, in terms of music, in terms of performances, in terms of everything, so it's, Year on year, you're adding to, to everything. So my success, or how well I'm doing in present times, is down to how we're hard working I have been over the past few years. But it's, it's definitely not easy, I don't think. It's not easy to make good music, and it's especially difficult to make easy music that really works well for people. Like a simple track is very difficult to make, if that makes sense. It's almost like a paradox. But in, to, answer your short, to answer your question, in a short answer, no. It's not easy. I don't think it's easy. Definitely not. Why do, you, uh, why do you do it? I do it because I have a love for the music and I have worked in normal jobs and I've hated it and I spent every day wanting to go home, not wanting to be there, wanting to be somewhere else. And now, now and in the past few years, The days fly by for me. I go into the studio, I'm working. I'm always working, working, working when I have to work. And the, t the days fly by. It's gone like that. It's five o'clock before you know. We spoke about this before. You know what happens at five o'clock. The day is over. So in terms of why I do it, it's, I suppose it's, it's sort of to make a difference to myself, um, to, to make an impact and to, to sort of leave a lasting impression that, When I do stop or when I do finish, I can say to myself that I had a true love for something and I went for it and I gave my very best and people enjoyed what I did. So it's, it's, that's, it's, I think it's as simple as that, really, to be honest. Has the, um, has the thought of stopping ever like seriously crossed your mind or are you just rolling on right now like no, a train? Well, I've, I've, I'm definitely starting to think about my future a lot more like in the, in the last year or so. I've, <laughs> I've started a pension. Uh, like a, I'm starting to think about this. I'm starting to think about like, like I'm, I don't want to be 50 and still traveling around the world and DJing and Um, missing out on other things and but it, it, the thought of it does scare me because to be honest I've no idea what I'm going to do when this all ends could I possibly move into management could I move into another section of the dance industry could I take my my knowledge and what I've learned through my experiences and help other people out and but I, I really really do not know to be honest and the thought of it does scare scare me quite a bit um, but at the same time I, I don't want to look too far forward and I'm just focusing on what's happening now, how I can make it good, how I can make this year good, and how I can keep on building and building and sort of keep on creating for myself and for my future. Uh, traveling as much as you do and going back and forth from different places, how do you keep your feet on the ground? In terms of... Uh, just no, but in terms of uh, being in, like... How do you switch to be home when you come back home? Is that easy or is that hard? We talked about it about Key 4050 yeah. as well. but Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, what I do is I literally, like, I throw myself back into it. Like, if say if I come home from, say, like, Australia or if I come home from South America or something and it's, if I get home first thing in the morning, the first thing I'll do, I'll go to the gym. I don't care how tired I am, how jet-lagged I am. 
I, I, I'm not the person that is going to go into bed and go to sleep. I couldn't even tell you the last time I had a lie-in or stayed in bed late or it's just something that I don't do. So I think the, the best way to work for me in terms of adjusting back is just to go back to your normal routine straight away and sort of get back into it. Don't dwell on what's happened over the past week, what you've experienced, all that stuff. Just leave it all behind and get back to normal. What does your uh, schedule look like? Do you play every weekend or do you travel every weekend? Or um, I've actually had the past, the past two weekends off and I was only playing for two weekends in January. So I was in Dallas and I was in El Paso in the second week of January and then I was just in Manchester um, in the last weekend. So I specifically did that with, this, with tonight and with this gig of mine so that I can focus on making music. And I sort of used January as sort of a sort of a detox, well not a detox because I still, <laughs> I still had some drinks and I still ate my food and ate whatever I wanted to eat but it's sort of a detox instead of uh, right it's time for a new year let's let's get the head down let's get some music made and sort of just going to bed at the same time every night not having to go anywhere and all that sort of stuff so it worked pretty well so the best way for me is just to straight back into it best way. So is it like a, a mind detox to recharge for, for the yeah, new year, for yeah. everything? Because I was speaking about this uh, already. I At the start of the year, I, uh, I decided to give up social media. So I haven't been on Facebook or Twitter this year. Because um, remember I spoke to you last year, remember I started it sort of in mid-2016 where I sort of I didn't check my timeline or my Facebook news feed. So uh, I took it on a step further, and I have Robbie, who helps me out with all my social media. He does everything. So anybody who's sending me any sort of messages, I'm sorry, I don't read it. Um, it for me, it just works out a lot better. I'm a lot clearer. Uh, it's just, it's taken up less space in my head. Um, it's, it's, I don't need to, I, what people are thinking of me is not really any of my business. I think the most important thing for me is how I feel about myself. And in this, at this moment in time, I'm happy with what I'm doing. I'm happy with how things are. And that's all that matters. I think the only, the only opinion that really matters is the one you have of yourself. So uh, if I could advise anyone to try it, I'd advise it to try it because it's, it's, it's incredible what it can actually do to your, to your headspace. You actually forget that people exist. In other words, sometimes you might go on, you see something that annoys you and go, oh my God, that person really annoys me. When you give it up, you forget that these people exist. And I think, without getting too spiritual or anything like that, I think you become more present and you're more sort of real. You, see, you can see things that are happening around you and you're more content with what you have. So try it out. How does, uh, how does your uh, friends look at this? Do you miss out on a lot of stuff when you're not on Facebook or social media? Not really, because I'm still on my WhatsApp all the time and the friends that I communicate with, I'll be communicating with on a daily basis, so I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything at all. No, no. I don't miss it. I really don't miss it. It's, I, I just see, like, because um, I, I see the abuse. I don't get any abuse around like that, but I just see how bad and how toxic that social media can be. And I do think that the, the positive stuff can have as much of a negative impact because when you're reading all that good stuff about yourself, there's always that little voice in your head that will have that sort of doubt saying like, why are these people saying this about you? Do you really believe that? I think everybody has that sort of, that little sort of devil on their shoulder or that voice in their head that tells them that they're not good enough and all that. So I think this way I'm remaining neutral. I'm not hearing good. I'm not hearing bad. I'm just focused on what I'm doing. And hopefully what I'm doing is good enough for other people to like. If they like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. I'm happy with what I'm doing. So it's good for me at the moment. So I'm doing... A set of trance today, right? And then I have a couple of weeks off until the next one, so yeah. I can really take everything in. What is it like for you to do, to play as much as you do? This was something we actually did in the Music First office uh, last year because we were, we were talking about the year we had and where we played. And I actually had to get a sheet of paper out, had to get my agenda, and actually look through where I had been. And I couldn't actually believe the amount of places that I was and some of the, the shows that I did almost in consecutive weeks. It was like all the moments had almost just merged into one. And 
I suppose it's, that's quite a positive thing that I had so many positive and amazing moments over the past 12 months that they sort of all merged into one. I didn't really have that many negative experiences in terms of where I played or, or in terms of my shows. Like, like take for example, from almost the end of February to the end of March last year, I did A State of Trance and then I did Dream State London. Following week, I went to Bangkok for transmission. Following weekend, I went to Buenos Aires and did Become One, and I did six hours at Groove. I think <laughs> if some people experienced even one of those in their lifetime, they'd be they'd be buzzing, you know that way. So like, all of those almost just merged into one. It's it's crazy that I I had to nearly go back and check where I was to to see what actually happened. So. As I said, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for moments like that. But at the same time, I'm very, very happy that the work that I'm putting in is giving me the opportunities to go and do these type of shows. Do you think it's sad that you don't remember specific moments? or It probably, it probably sounds a little bit that I don't appreciate it, but I do appreciate it. It's just that, as I said, I'm quite lucky in that these type of gigs are almost, it's, they've become the norm for me. So... They sort of, as they said, they're merging into one. But it's just that, as I said to you, I'm not someone that's going home, sitting down and dwelling on the fact that these gigs are over or that, that, that I've done them or oh, I wish I was playing there this weekend because I know that another one is going to happen this year. So there's no reason for me to dwell on it. So I, re I think the reason why is because I don't dwell on it because I know that I have a very prosperous and bright future in terms of gigs and that so it's it, there's no need for me to dwell on it so I'm, I'm trying to stay present and sort of look to the future rather than look back so maybe that's why I, I sort of become a little bit forgetful about these things yeah why do you think you have reached this level that you're at right now um i don't know i think it's sort of just hard work and i know We've been doing these. We've been doing these interview conversations for a, a, a few years, and the music that I'm into and the sort of sound, it's it's still the same. But when we started out doing our interviews, the music that I was into, it wasn't necessarily the the in thing or the the big sound, wasn't it? It was more of a progressive EDM, trousy sort of sound. So as that sort of sound made a resurgence, with me being the person that was always playing those tracks and having a, a really good label and having solid tracks over the past few years, I think that sort of kept me up there with, with everyone else. So I think that that's probably the main reason. Maybe. I don't know. It's, it's hard for me to answer that. It's, um, it's sort of difficult to see how you were doing. It's always easier for someone else to see how you were doing. So it's, you, that could be maybe easier for you to answer rather than, than me because I'm so involved in what I'm doing and I'm sort of always working on other stuff to sort of look back and understand why it's happened. Um, I, sort of, I sort of just have faith in what is happening and how it has happened and why it has happened and sort of I don't look to question it too much. You know? what's, the, um, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made in your career? I'm not going to lie, there's been times where I've had maybe a couple of couple too many drinks to play and I haven't given my best performance and with myself being my biggest critic, no one is a bigger critic of themselves than I am, so I've beaten myself up quite badly about that, so they would be things that I would personally regard myself as mistakes, but at the same time I've learned from them and... Uh, it's something that I've tried to eradicate from happening in the future, so hopefully nothing like that happens tonight. But yeah, I, just, I think y you need the bad moments in order to learn and to grow up. And I think I've grown up a lot over the past few years, definitely. Even in terms of some of the stuff like I used to post on Twitter, like in terms of tweets, maybe like just just talking crap and just being a dope, like just talking shit about crap, like just. Saying stuff, like, I don't know, maybe trying to impress people or just, it's probably like an insecurity thing or something, I don't know, but I'm glad that I don't have to rely on that sort of stuff anymore. It's just, I just make music, I play my gigs, I try to be a decent person, and it's just as simple as that. Were you one of those uh, Twitter uses that you don't want to see today? Was that you a couple of years back? 
probably could have been, yeah, it could have been just a bit melty or like if I didn't like something, I'd be posting about it or like even just I'd be posting stuff after a football match, like giving out about footballers or, or stuff like that. But just things like that, yeah. I, if, I'd say if I saw some of my tweets or some of the stuff I was posting from a few years ago, I'd be looking at it cringe and going, you are an absolute dope. What were you doing? I should have printed some of those, actually. That's yeah. something you can do next year. Yeah, you yeah for sure. Yeah. But yeah, you said football, right? Yeah. Football is the reason why you use Instagram, I heard. Yeah, that's so. Instagram remains on my phone. I have no Twitter, I have no Facebook on my phone, but uh, I still have the Instagram because I'm communicating with a lad who's giving me tickets for a United-Liverpool game. So yeah, I've been been talking to him. But yeah, football is, um, to be honest, the, it's, it's a huge part of my life. I'm a Manchester United fan and I'm a huge football fan in, uh, in general. And to be honest... The most, uh, the only things I really listen to now, if I'm in the car or if I'm at the gym, is just football podcasts because I like to listen to people talk about things I'm interested in, rather than watching a random game or something. I like people conversing and stuff that I'm interested in. Yeah. In your career, like, have you ever lost focus musically or production-wise or as a person or anything like that? Um, I think it was almost. The opposite way I went to your question, I think I went too far into my career. That it's sort of, I lost focus on who I was as a person. So like, I would be spending every single minute of every day trying to progress myself as a DJ, as a producer, online presence, all that sort of stuff, networking, all that sort of crack. And then, to be perfectly honest, I sort of lost track with who I was as a person. I, it was almost nearly an identity crisis. So um, that would have been, let me see, roughly maybe two years, maybe from around 2009 to roughly 2011. So it probably coincided with the time where I finished working in my normal job and was making the transition into sort of turning my hobby and my 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 pastime into a, a a career that was going to support me in in life so but as the time went on i started started to move away from having to think that i needed to put all this time and focus like i still give my full attention and my focus into what i do and i still love what i do but my whole life isn't revolving around what i need to be or who i need to be as a dj and what i need to be doing on a daily basis i think the fact that I have a stable home life and all that stuff, it, it works to my advantage in that my, my, my personal and professional lives have that happy balance. So I really always come back to this word balance and this happy medium between the two. Because when the two of them are working together, I think you're, you're going to be happy in your work and you're going to be happy in your home life. So w once I have that, that happy medium and I can keep that going, that's, that's good enough for me. I, I don't want to go back to those dark days of having to sort of feel like I needed to network or I needed to constantly be doing something to sort of develop the, the, the Brian Carney DJ producer, whoever. That, that sort of online presence or whatever has to be. Yeah. What do you think would have happened if, if um, let's go back five years or something, what do you think would have happened if you didn't reach another higher level and if you would have been still fighting to be able to reach because now I don't know how many pl times you played ASOT but you're becoming a regular here so you're at a pretty good level to yeah. say at least what do you think would have happened if you didn't reach this this level I don't know I would have kept working because to, to be honest I think I would have still got here I think I, I, I'm a very determined person and when I set my mind to something I'm gonna I'm gonna get it so I think I probably still would have ended up on the same path. It might have been a little bit more difficult, but for me, it's, failure isn't an option when it comes to stuff like this. If, if I want to achieve something, I'm going to do my very best and I'm going to give everything I possibly can to, to getting to where I need to be. What are you uh, working on right now? Um, well, for tonight, I've made three tracks under my Carney alias, sort of really simplistic, club, uh, tech-based tracks. 
and then I have the vocal track with Deirdre McLaughlin as well and we still have the I'm working on a lot of key 4050 stuff as well because we're doing a it's the first ever video live broadcast from Transmission in Bangkok in March St. Patrick's weekend in March so myself and John were working on new stuff to debut especially for that event so it's I'm, I'm always wanting to make new stuff I, I'm getting to the stage now where I want to when I play a show I want the vast majority of the music to be my own that's uh, that's I think if if people are bringing you to a country to play or if a crowd is coming to see you play I think it's sort of something that you need to do you need to sh you need to play your music and showcase what you're all about don't get me wrong I'm still going to play music from other people but I'm working to that stage where I can nearly play a three or four hour set of my own music and I like every single track and I'm happy with the production and all that sort of stuff so that's what I'm aiming towards are you are you producing for that as well, or are you taking stuff that you have, or are you producing for for a full Carney set? Oh, um, well, to be honest, I probably have in, in the last two three years. I probably have like eight or nine Carney tracks done under that sound. So I could easily have fourteen, fifteen tracks like that by the end of this year. So maybe I don't know. Maybe I will release an album. Maybe I will release an extended EP or something like that. What, this year already? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe not. So, like, I have eight tracks there. Um, the tracks, those type of tracks, they're quite, I'm not going to say they're easy to make, but I don't really have problems making them because they're just mainly samples and uh, a kick and a bass, some percussion loops and some effects. So they're, so they're quite easy to make compared to, like, the vocal trance or big room trance tracks that, that we'll be making as well. So maybe, yeah, maybe. I think you're after maybe just putting an idea in my head to maybe do an album this year. It's something that could happen. Maybe I could start doing specific carny sets at festivals or something. You never know. We'll see. I like the the idea of this though, and the sound of this too. Yeah. If we move away, uh... <laughs> <laughs> if we uh, move away a little bit from music, you've actually had. A couple of big milestones in your uh, personal life as well. How how would you explain those? Yeah, in the past past twelve months, I've got engaged to get married. So that's probably going to be next year at some stage. We're still undecided about where it's going to be, um, but something very exciting. When you say we, is it the two of you that decide, or is it? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> uh, of course, it's the two of us that will decide. Yeah, we, we've been looking at venues, but. Um, to be honest, I'm actually more picky when it's coming to these venues than oh, Adele really? is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I sort of uh, I have a strict idea in my head of where I want it to be because I don't plan on doing it again. So I want it to be how I want it as well. You know? How would you want it? What, like, what's your, your dream wedding? Well, I don't know what my dream wedding is, but I'm not into this like traditional old style. I'm into a more modern sort of buzz. So uh, that, would, that would be my preference. So we're still looking around. Um, we went to Ibiza in October to sort of look at some wedding venues and stuff, but it's, it's stupid money over there. You're paying for the Ibiza name. It's crazy. So it's more than likely going to be in Ireland. And we also moved into our own house over the past 12 months as well. So the past 12 months is too. I'm growing up. I am actually am growing up and maturing. <laughs> so it uh, has been scary at times, and but it's been good. And I'm very excited about the future and what happens. What happens more in the future then? I have to wait and see. I have to wait and see. Maybe get another car. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Let's see. How is Jackson, by the way? He's amazing. Uh, it's 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 amazing how uh, how much you can love something that's not human and it's not yours. Uh, he's like our child, and he loves his new house. He's happier than he's ever been. So, uh, but at the same time, I spend more time than I do with him than anyone else. So that's why I think we have such a good connection. So he's really good. I'll send John more videos of what he gets up to on a daily basis. <laughs> Do you think he helps you when you come back from traveling too? Well, definitely. Um, it's, it's only when you have something like that that you realize that there was a massive void before he was actually there. You realize what you were missing by having him. It's, he, he, he puts you in a good mood. Like you're, never, you're never in a bad mood when he's around. And if I am in a bad mood, I just look at him and he's just staring at me with his face on him and it's all good, you know? So perfect, perfect. So I love him.